Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we're gonna be learning how to run code concurrently using the threading module. Now, this has been a highly requested video for some time now, so I'm glad that I finally am getting around to this. Now, I'm also gonna be doing a follow-up video showing how to run code in parallel using the multi-processing module, and we'll also look at when you would wanna use one over the other. Now, if you don't know the difference between threading and multi-processing, then you should have a grasp on the difference between those once we're finished up. Now, I would like to mention that we do have a sponsor for this video, and that is Brilliant.org. So I really wanna thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and it would be great if you all could check them out using the link in the description section below and support the sponsors. And I'll talk more about their services in just a bit. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so first, why would we wanna use threading? So basically, we wanna use threading whenever it's going to significantly speed up our program. Now, this speed up comes from running different tasks concurrently. And we'll talk more about concurrency and what that means in just a second. Now, speed ups aren't really guaranteed, so it really just depends on what you're doing. So in this video, we're gonna start off uh, with a basic example where we learn how to run some simple sleep methods concurrently, but then we'll finish up with a real world example where we download some high resolution images from the internet. Now I wanna show that real world example because you know personally, when I watch tutorials that only show how it works with a basic example, then I always feel like it doesn't really, uh, that I don't walk away with any actual useful knowledge. Uh, so we'll use the sleep method to get a good idea of how to use threading. And then we'll be sure to go over the more complicated real world example of downloading images online. So let's go ahead and get started. So I have a starting script open up here. And if you'd like to follow along, then I'll be sure to have a link to this code in the description section below as well. And like I said, we'll start with a very simple example and see how this works and then build up to more realistic examples. So for the script here, I'm just importing the time method, and then I am uh, starting a counter. This is just so we can measure how long this entire script takes, so you really don't have to pay attention to these, li these lines here. Uh, but then we just have a simple function called do something, and this is printing that we're gonna sleep for one second, then we actually sleep for a second, and then I print that we are done sleeping. And then we are running that function, and then I am getting the finish time here, and then I'm printing out that our script finished and I'm printing out the total number of seconds. Okay, so if I run the code that we have right now, we can see that it said that we're sleeping for one second, that we're done sleeping, and that we finished in one second. And that sounds about right since we're running the do something function one time and that's sleeping for one second. And if we were to run that function twice, then our program will likely take two seconds. So let's go ahead and see that. So I'm just gonna copy that and execute that function again and if I run this, then we can see sleeping for a second, sleeping for a second, finished in a little over two seconds. So we can see that each time we run the do something function, it's adding about one second to our script, but it's not really doing anything on the CPU in that function, it's just sleeping. So our script is just waiting around, sleeping for a second, and once that's done, it moves on to run that next function and sit around, uh, sits around waiting for another second sleeping. And then at that point, we're basically done and our script finishes. Now, I created a quick graphic here to represent what this looks like. So let me pull this open here in my browser. So basically, this is what our script looks like right now. We're running a function here, and then it is sleeping for one second, but this is just us sitting around waiting. And after that second, we run another function here, and then it comes up here and waits another second, and then finally we are done. And running everything in order like this is called running it synchronously. And so anytime our program is running synchronously, it actually isn't doing much on the CPU, and it's just waiting around like this. And that's usually a good sign of when we can get some benefits from using threading and concurrency. Now, these are called CPU bound and IO bound tasks. Now, CPU bound tasks are things that are crunching a lot of numbers and using the CPU. And the IO bound tasks are things that are just waiting for input and output operations to be completed and not really using the CPU all that much. So some other examples of IO bound tasks include, uh, you know, reading and writing from the file system and other file system operations, uh, network operations, downloading stuff online and things like that. So when it comes to threading, we're gonna see benefits when our tasks are IO bound, which again means that we're doing a lot of waiting around for input and output operations, like you know reading data from disk or network operations. Now, if our tasks are doing a lot of data crunching and are CPU bound, then we're not gonna get that much of a benefit from using threading. As a matter of fact, uh, so, some programs actually run slower using threads because of the added overhead costs when they're uh, creating and destroying different threads. Now, if a task is CPU bound, 
then we'll likely want to use multiprocessing and run it in parallel instead. And again, we're going to take a look at that in the next video. So when we run something concurrently using threads, it's not actually going to run the code at the same time. It just gives the illusion of running code at the same time because when it comes to a point where it's just waiting around, it's just going to go ahead and move forward with the script and run other code while the IO operations finish. And I've got another graphic put together of what this looks like. So here's an example of what our code would look like when we use threading. So we're gonna run this function and we can see that it comes up here and waits a second. But as soon as that starts waiting, our code is just going to move on and go ahead and run another function uh, while we're waiting for this one second to be done sleeping. And then we kick off this other second. So these are actually overlapped here, but we never actually ran any of this code at the same time. It's just going to give the illusion of running the code at the same time. And then finally, we can see that we uh, are done a little bit sooner. Now this graph isn't a scale. Uh, you know, these weights here would actually be much shorter. Okay, so now that we've actually talked about concurrency and when to use threads, now let's see how to actually do this with our current script. So first, let's import the threading module. Now this is in the standard library, so we don't need to install anything. Uh, so I'm gonna come up here to the top and I'm just going to uh, import threading. Now I'm gonna show an older way of how to do threading first so that we can get a good idea of what's going on. Uh, but if it seems confusing at first, then definitely stick around because I'm also gonna show some newer ways of doing threading using pools that allow us to add threading to our programs with a lot fewer lines of code. Okay, so first, instead of running the do something function twice in a row like this, let's instead turn both of these into threads. So to do this, I'm gonna create two threads for both of these. So to do this, I'm just gonna overwrite where we are setting these functions here. And I'm gonna create one thread called T1. And this is going to be threading.thread. And now we wanna set a target. And our target is the function that we wanna run. And that is the do something function. Now we actually wanna pass in the function here. Uh, we don't wanna execute the function. So don't put on parentheses like this. We just wanna pass in uh, the function by itself unexecuted. Okay, so now let me copy this line and let's create another thread. So I will call this T2 and we will keep everything else the same. We're just creating a thread with that target of do something. Okay, so at this point, we've created two thread objects, but we're not actually running that code. So if I run this, then we can see that it finished immediately, but nothing from our function got printed out. So our function actually didn't run. So in order to get our threads to run, we need to use the start method on each thread. So here below T2, I'm just gonna say T1.start and T2.start. And that will uh, actually run our threads, but it not, might not actually do exactly what we think it'll do. So if we run this right now, then we can see that it now runs the functions and we can see that it printed out uh, the first lines from both of those functions here. Let me make this a little larger. So it printed out that both of our threads were gonna sleep for a second. And then it said that our script was finished in zero seconds. And then it printed out that it's done sleeping. Now our script actually took around one second to complete, but the reason that it says that it completed in zero seconds is because it started both of those threads. And while the threads were sleeping, our script ran concurrently and continued on with the rest of the script. So it immediately came down and calculated our finish time here and printed out our last print statement as our threads were still sleeping. And then once that one second was up, our threads continued on and both printed that they were done sleeping. Now, what if we wanted our threads to finish before we calculated the finish time and before we printed out that our script was finished? So in order to do this, we can use the join method. So to do this, just below our starts, I'm also going to run the join method on both of these. And that will make sure that they complete before moving on to calculate the finish time and to print out this statement here. So if I save this and run it, then we can see that both of our threads started at almost the exact same time. And then they both printed out that they were done sleeping after a second. And then our script continued on to print that our script finished after one second. Now, if using threads seems a bit complicated right now, then definitely stick around until the end of the video because we're gonna see an easier way of how to do what we're doing here. Uh, but I think it's important to understand what this is doing so far, even if we use other methods where we don't manually call these start and join methods. Okay, so right now we're not really getting that big of a speed up here. So our code ran in two seconds before, and now it's running in one second. 
but that's because our function doesn't take too long and we're only running it twice. But what if we wanted to run our function 10 times? Well, if we were to run our code synchronously, where it runs one after the other, then we can take a guess that it would take about 10 seconds since one would have to finish before another started. But if we ran this with threads, then it should still be around one second to complete. So let's go ahead and see an example of this. Now, instead of manually creating 10 different threads, let's instead create and start these threads in a loop. So to do this, I'm going to come up here and copy this threading part here. And now I'm just gonna remove everything that we had here before. And now I'm just gonna create a loop. So I'll say four underscore in range of 10. And then I'm gonna say T for our thread is equal to uh, threading.thread with a target of do something. And now let's also start that thread within our loop. Now, if none of you have ever seen an underscore uh, in Python here, Basically, this just means it's a throwaway variable because all we want to do is loop over these 10 uh, numbers here, but we're not actually doing anything with it. So I just have an underscore variable uh, so that uh, just to say that we're not using anything within the loop. Okay, so now we have our loop here and our threads are starting, uh, but we can't actually do a T or a thread dot join within the loop because it would join on the thread before looping through and creating and starting the next thread. So it would basically be the same as running the code synchronously. So we need a way that we can start all of these threads in one loop and then loop through the threads again and run the join method on them so that they all finish before the end of our script. So to do this, we can append each thread that we create to a list of threads. So above the for loop here, I'm gonna create a list of threads, and this is just gonna be empty for now. And now below t.start, I'm going to say threads.append, and we will append each thread that we started. So now, once we go through this loop, uh, we should have a list of all these threads that we started. So now let's run join on all of those. So I'll say for thread in threads, and then we will do a thread.join. Okay, so now we're actually running this do something function 10 times, and it sleeps for one second every time. But since we're using threads, it's just gonna keep moving forward each time we sleep. So instead of taking 10 seconds, uh, let's run this and see how long it takes. So we can see all those got kicked off, and our script still finished in just one second. Okay, so that's pretty good. So we've already taken a script that normally would take 10 seconds, and we've instead finished it in one second. Okay, so now let's look at how we can pass in arguments into our function. So right now we're running a function that doesn't accept any arguments, but let's add a couple real quick so we can see what this looks like. So right now we're just sleeping for one second, but let's add an argument that specifies uh, how long we actually wanna sleep. So up here in our do something function, I'm gonna pass in an argument and I'll just call this seconds. And now I will say that we are sleeping for uh, however many seconds, and this needs to now be uh, an F string so that we can pass in the variable like that. And now, instead of sleeping for one second, we'll sleep for the number of seconds that we passed in as a variable here. And just so this doesn't say sleeping for 10 seconds or something like that, uh, let's also say that this could be seconds as well. Okay. Okay, so now our function is expecting an argument for the number of seconds to sleep. So let's pass in seconds as an argument, and we need to pass that in as a list of arguments. So down here where we create our thread, uh, this is where we're going to pass in our arguments. So this is just an args argument, and we will pass this in as a list. Now we only have one argument, so this is just gonna be a list of one value. So let's sleep for 1.5 seconds instead. So now we should expect our function to take about 1.5 seconds every time. So if I save this and run it, then we can see that now we are finished with our entire script in 1.5 seconds. And this still ran this function 10 times. Uh, so normally this would take 15 seconds if we were to run this synchronously, uh, but now we're finishing it in 1.5 seconds. Okay, so I said before that I was gonna show you the older way of doing threads, and then I'd also show you what I believe is a faster and easier way of doing this. Now, I still wanted to show you the manual way of creating these threads, because I think this can still be useful depending on what you're doing, but I also think it's better to learn uh, this manual way first to understand uh, a little bit better of what's going on in the background. But in Python 3.2, 
they added something called a thread pool executor. And in a lot of cases, this is gonna be an easier and more efficient way to run these threads. And it also allows us to easily switch over to using multiple processes instead of threads as well, uh, depending on the problem that we're trying to solve. So let's replace what we currently have and instead use this thread pool executor. Now this is actually not in the threading module, it's in the concurrent futures module. So at the top, instead of using importing the threading module, uh, I'm going to import, and I don't think I even need threading anymore, so I'm just going to import concurrent.futures. And when we use this thread pool executor, it's usually best to use this with a context manager. So above our threads list here, I'm just gonna do the same thing that we already have uh, using uh, the concurrent futures module instead. So to do this, I'm just gonna say with, and let me go ahead and exit out so we can see a little bit more of the screen here. So I'm gonna say with concurrent dot futures dot, and this is thread pool, whoops, let me uh, spell that correctly, thread pool executor. And we will say as executor there. And now with our executor, there are a couple of different methods that we can use. So if we want to execute the function once at a time, then we can use the submit method. So the submit method schedules a function to be executed and returns a future object. So let's add this in and I'll explain this a little bit uh, more. So I'll say F1 is equal to executor.submit and we will now pass in the function and the arguments. So I'm gonna say do something is the function that we want to run and we'll just pass in an argument of one for one second. So again, the submit method schedules a function to be executed and returns a future object. Now a future object basically encapsulates the execution of our function and allows us to check in on it after it's been scheduled. So we can check that it's running or if it's done and also check the result. So if we grab the result, then it'll give us the return value of the function. Now, right now we're just printing out values and not returning anything, but let me add a return value so that we can grab that. So instead of printing out that we are done sleeping here, instead, let me return that string of done sleeping. And okay, let me take out these parentheses here. Okay, so now we are returning that string instead of printing it out. So if we still want to print that, then we need to print the return value of that function. So let's grab that by using the result method. So here within the context manager, I'm just going to say print and we will print f1.result. Now, if we run the result method here, then it will actually wait around until the function completes. Okay, so let's comment out what we had before. So all of this code here is how we did threads previously. And now let's run this code with our uh, new thread pool executor here. Okay, so we can see that that works and that's a lot less code than we had down here that's commented out. And if we wanted to run this multiple times, then we could run uh, submit multiple times as well. So uh, above our F1 result, let me create another uh, future object here. So this will be F2. Uh, we'll just keep everything else the same. And now let's also print out the F2 result. So if I save that and run it, then we can see both of those got kicked off at the same time and that we finished our script in one second. And if we wanted to run this 10 times like we did before, then we likely wouldn't want to run submit 10 different times. So we could use a loop like we did before. So instead of running one at a time, I'm instead going to use a loop. And we could use a regular loop like we did before, uh, but I'll go ahead and use a list comprehension to create these instead. So we could say, uh, let me just copy this entire uh, submit line here. And instead, I'm going to say results is equal to, and now let's create a, a list comprehension. So I'm gonna say that we want to run executor.submit with our do something function and an argument of one second for, and then just an underscore for uh, to, as a throwaway variable, uh, in range of 10. Now, if you've never used list comprehensions before, then I do have a separate video on that if you'd like to see exactly how this works. But again, if you're not familiar with list comprehensions, uh, then you can use a regular for loop like we did down here at the bottom.
Okay, so now we've created a list comprehension that's running our submit function 10 different times with an argument of one second. Now, in order to get these results, we can actually use another function from the concurrent futures module called as completed. Now, this will give us an iterator that we can loop over that will yield the results of our threads as they're completed. So I think this is a uh, really useful method. So to use this, we can just say, uh, I'm going to get rid of our lines here, and I'm just going to say 4f in concurrent dot futures and then dot as underscore completed. And we want to pass in our results list here uh, to our as completed method. And within this list, we can just say print f dot result. So if we run this, then we can see that it still ran, it, ran that 10 times. And if we scroll down to the bottom here, then we can see that it still ran this in one second. Now to prove that these are actually coming in as they're completed, let me actually pass in a different range of seconds for our threads to sleep. And those should print out in the order that they complete. So I'll create a list of seconds to sleep here. So above our results, I'm just gonna create another list and I will call this sex is equal to, and I'll do five, four, three, two, and one. And now instead of uh, use, passing in one here, I'm instead gonna pass in a second for a second in our list of seconds. And I'm also gonna print out the seconds in the return statement as well. Uh, that way we can see which ones are finishing and in what order. So I'm gonna make this an F string as well. And just here at the end, I will just print out uh, the seconds argument that we are passing in. So again, what our list uh, comprehension here is doing is we are submitting this do something second with this argument of sec, and we are doing that for each value of seconds in the seconds list. So this should get submitted five times with a five, four, three, two, and a one. So if I save this and run it, then we can see that it says sleeping five seconds, four, three, but then the order that these finished was that it was done sleeping for one second first, then two, then three, then four, then five and our total script took five seconds to complete. Now we actually started the five second thread first, but since we used that as completed method, it printed out our results in the order that they completed. Okay, so with the submit method, it's submitting each function once at a time. Now in order to run submit on an entire list, then we need to do a loop or a comprehension like we did here. But if you're familiar with the built-in map method in Python, then there's actually something similar that we can do with threads where we can use a map method to run our function over a list of values. Now, if you're familiar with that built-in Python map method, then this is actually very similar, except it uses threads instead. So it runs the function with every item of the iterable that we pass in. So let's say that I want to map our function to our list of seconds. So to do this, we could say here, uh, let me, let me just overwrite all of this that we have now. And instead, I will use a map method and say results is equal to executor.map. And we wanna map the do something function. And we want to uh, pass in our iterator of seconds here. So again, what map is going to do is it is going to run the do something function with every value in this list of seconds here. Now, when we use the submit method, it returned a future object. And when we use map, it instead returns the results. Now, it's going to still run those threads concurrently, but instead of running the re results as they completed, like we saw before, uh, map is going to return the results in the order that they were started. So to loop over these results, we can just say for result in results, and then ju let's just print out that result. So if I run this, then we can see that it started off all of our sleeps, but nothing has returned yet. Uh, and then it returned the done sleeping for five seconds, four, three, two, one. So we can see that all of our threads kicked off at pretty much the same time, uh, but then it looked like they completed all at the same time as well. Now they didn't actually all complete at the same time, but when you loop over your results using map, like we did here, then it returns the results in the order that they were started. So since we slept for five seconds first, uh, then we waited for uh, that one to finish before printing out the other results.
but it still didn't slow us down at all. Uh, we can see that our entire script still took about five seconds in total to finish. Now, another thing to point out here is that if our function raises an exception, then it, it won't actually raise the exception while running the thread. The exception will be raised when its value is retrieved from this results iterator. So if you need to handle exceptions, then you can do that within the iterator if you'd like. Now, if you'd like to learn more about handling exceptions, then I do have a more in-depth video if you'd like to learn more about that. And I'll be sure to leave a link to that video in the description section below uh, for anyone who is interested. Now, even if we don't grab uh, all of our results within the context manager here, it's still going to automatically join all of those and let them finish after the context manager ends. So if we comment out where we're printing the results and I run this, then we can see that it still waits until these are done, until it gets down to the end of our script. So it didn't do like it did before when we didn't have joins and say that we finished in zero seconds, even though it actually wasn't finished yet. So it still waited for the threads in that thread pool to complete uh, before printing out that our script was done. Okay, so now that we've looked at a basic example using sleep, now let's take a look at a more real world example of where threading would be useful. So I've got another script open here where I'm not using threading at the moment. Uh, so let me pull this up and let's take a look at what this is doing. And again, I'm gonna have a link to this code in the description section below for anyone who wants to follow along. So this is a script that goes out and downloads some high resolution photos from Unsplash. Now, if you don't know what Unsplash is, it's a website that has some really nice free photos available for anyone to use. So let me go over this script and show how uh, someone might do this normally. So normally you might have a bunch of image URLs here that you wanna download. And now let's say we actually wanna download those. So somebody might say, okay, so for each image URL in our image URLs, uh, let's use the request library to go out and get that content. And now I'm just doing some string parsing here to parse out the image name, which would just be this section right here. So I'm grabbing the image name and then putting a .jpg onto the end of that. And now I'm opening a file here in byte mode. And then I am writing those image bytes that we downloaded from the internet onto our file system. And then we're just printing out here that our image was downloaded. Okay, so this script should go all th uh, through all of these image URLs and download all of these images into my current directory. So if I run this right now, then let's see how long this takes. Now we can see that these are downloading and I do have this pulled up here in my uh, file system as well. So we can see that it is going out and downloading these, but it's downloading them one at a time. So there should be 15 total here. So once this is finished, then we can get an idea of how long this took. And it should be done any second now. Okay, so we can see that this finished in 23 seconds to download those 15 high resolution photos online. Now, when we're downloading a lot of things online, this is actually a great candidate to use threading because this is one of those IO bound operations that is actually spending a lot of time just waiting around. It's not, it's uh, going out and waiting for a response from the site and it's not moving on to the next URL until that gets an entire response back. So if we use threads, that, then it can actually go ahead and move on uh, to the next URL while that's waiting around for a response and we can make other requests at the same time. Okay, so now let's see how we can change this code uh, that someone might normally write and instead change this to where it's using threads instead and see if we can speed this up. So first, let's think about what we're doing here. So we're looping over our list of image URLs and then using the request library to download those one at a time. So if we remember from our previous example, uh, this would be a pretty good candidate for the threading pool map uh, for the threading pool map method uh, where we can pass in a function and a list and have that function run with every value in that list. And if that doesn't make sense right now, then uh, well, it should make more sense once we actually change this code here. Um, but first, we're gonna have, have to actually create a function that will download the data from a single URL. So to do that, we can just say, I'm just gonna change this for loop here and I'm gonna turn this into a function. So I'm gonna say, download uh, underscore image, and we wanna pass in an argument of the image URL. And everything within this function can just stay the same because we were looping over that uh, before, 
And now we just turn that into a function where we are just downloading one image URL at a time. So it's basically the same thing as our for loop for now. Okay, so now that we have a function that downloads one image at a time, uh, now we can create a thread pool and map our list of URLs using that function that we just created. So first, let's import the concurrent futures module so that we can use that. So here at the top, I'm going to, uh, actually, let me put this below time here. I will import concurrent.futures. And now down here below our function, uh, let's create a thread pool executor. So just like before, that was concurrent.futures. We're using this within a context manager. We want this to be a thread pool executor. Make sure I spell that correctly. And we will say as executor there for our context manager. Okay, so now if we use that map method, so I'm going to say executor.map, and we want to run this function, and let's pass in our list of image URLs. And again, uh, just to go over this one more time, uh, the map method here, what it will do is it will run this download image function with each value in this image URLs list. But since we're using a thread pool executor, it's going to actually download, download those with a different thread for each one. So just with those small changes, this will actually use threads and make those requests asynchronously instead of synchronously like we saw before. So now if I run this code to download all these images again, then we can see that these are coming in a lot faster because it's using threads instead of doing this synchronously. So now we can see that it finished in five seconds instead. And if you remember before we ran that, it was taking 23 seconds. So that's a pretty significant speed up. And this would be even more significant if we were doing even more requests. So the speed ups can be you know, pretty drastic uh, depending on what we're actually doing. Now, what would be an example of something that wouldn't be IO bound? Well, if something is doing a lot of computation, then threads actually wouldn't be ideal for that type of task. So if we are processing the photos and resizing them and things like that, instead of just downloading them uh, from line, uh, then the threads wouldn't actually speed that up all that much. So that would actually be an example of something that is CPU bound and not IO bound. And like I said before, uh, in those kinds of scenarios, threads can actually slow down our script instead because the threads have some overhead when being created and destroyed. So it really depends on what you're doing in order to decide if the right choice to speed up your program is threading or multiprocessing. So when you're doing something that uh, requires a lot of processing, then we can use multiprocessing instead of threading. So with that said, in the next video, let's go ahead and process these photos that we just downloaded and do some image manipulation to them. And then we can take a look at the multi-processing module to see how we can speed up that task as well. Uh, that way we can see the difference between threading and multi-processing and when you might want to use one over the other. Now, before we finish up here, I'd like to mention the sponsor of this video, and that is Brilliant.org. So we've been talking a lot about threading and multiprocessing, and these topics are especially useful in the field of data science. And data science is a field that is growing at a very rapid pace. If you'd like to learn more about programming and data science, then I would definitely recommend checking out Brilliant.org. So Brilliant is a problem-solving website that helps you understand underlying concepts by actively working through guided lessons. And they've recently added some brand new interactive content that makes solving puzzles and challenges even more fun and hands-on. And if you'd like to learn more about data science and programming with Python, then I would recommend checking out their new probability course that covers everything from the basics to real-world applications and also fun things like casino games. They even use Python in their statistics courses and will quiz you on how to correctly analyze the data within the language. So their guided lessons will challenge you, but you also have the ability to get hints or even solutions if you need them. It's really tailored towards understanding the material. They even have a code environment built into their website so that you can run code directly in the browser. And that is a great compliment to watching my tutorials because you can apply what you've learned in their active problem solving environment and that helps to solidify that knowledge. So to support my channel and learn more about Brilliant, you can go to brilliant.org forward slash CMS to sign up for free. 
And also the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. And you can find that link in the description section below. And again, that is brilliant.org forward slash CMS. Okay, so I think that is gonna do it for this video. I hope you feel like you got a good idea of how to use the threading module and how we can use this to speed up our scripts. Now, there are some more advanced topics that we could cover in the future with threads, uh, such as thread local data, race conditions, locks, and things like that. But we'll save that for a future video if anyone is interested. And like I said, in the next video, we'll see how to use the multiprocessing module to do the same thing that we did in this video. But instead, the task will be image processing instead of downloading images. But if anyone has any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free to ask in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer those. And if you enjoy these tutorials and would like to support them, then there are several ways you can do that. The easiest way is to simply like the video and give it a thumbs up. And also it's a huge help to share these videos with anyone who you think would find them useful. And if you have the means, you can contribute through Patreon. And there's a link to that page in the description section below. Be sure to subscribe for future videos and thank you all for watching.